Hi everyone. Uh, welcome back to Learning Lords of Middle Earth, episode number five. I might be doing this one a little bit earlier than makes sense. No, it, it kind of makes sense anyway. I was just really excited to do this one. So I want to cover all the alternate companions and I'm going to rank uh, personally which ones I think make the most sense. So at the bottom of the list, we have Dunedan. Um, let's see if this shows up. Do you guys see that? Um, no, you guys don't see it. That's a bummer. Okay. Anyway, uh, maybe I'll try to include a picture of it on the thumbnail anyway. But after you click view the free people's hand, it. I'm going to click all the alternate companions just so I can show you what they look like anyway. Uh, I'll, I'll include a thumbnail. It, it puts this little picture up anyway for you to look at. And, and at the start of the game, before you draw any cards, it asks you to choose all the alternate companions. So the first alternate one is Gandalf Keeper of Narya that we've already covered. And then there's Strider the Dunedon, who provides a different ability. And then all five of the other companions, as the alternate ones, have the option of starting out somewhere in Middle-earth. So Legolas the Elven Prince starts in Woodland Realm. Uh, Gimli the Dwarven Lord starts in Erebor. Um, both Merry and Pippin, Hobbits of the Shire, have the option of starting in the Shire. And Boromir, Captain General of Gondor, start, has the option of starting in Minas Tirith. So all five of these have a unique ability. They don't activate their nation automatically, but you may spend any dime to activate their nation and advance it one step towards war. So you could use a Palantir, a character die, anything to muster the elves to war, if you start with Legolas out, or the dwarves to war and activate it with Ghibli. And, you know, same with Gondor and the North with these two. So you could do all of this. You could start with all of these companions out. I've never seen anyone actually do that. Um, I suppose you could go for like a hardcore free people's military attempt. So if you start with one companion out, you give Shadow a token. If you start with two or more characters out, then you give them both tokens. So they have the option of either mustering down a nation or this token, which allows them to move all leadership. Or, uh, most times people take the muster one. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the other couple of differences here anyway. So there's Dunedon. He's at the bottom of the list because I, uh, I think he's the worst anyway. Um, his ability, so normal Strider allows you to hide with any die. So you're revealed here, you can spend any die to hide again. How Dunedon works is that if you're on step one or higher of the Fellowship track, um, and Dunedon is the guide, you may spend a die to move the Fellowship Uh, and the Shadow Player would roll a two at six, you're safe. So the Dunedon allows you to then take this die and put it over here instead. So it's as if you hadn't moved the Fellowship again. So the next time you move, you're again being hit on two at six. So that is helpful, but it requires a fairly specific set of circumstances. Like you need to be above movement. And every time you declare forward, then you're back down to zero movement and you can't use his ability anymore. And also, if you get revealed, then you can't hide as flexibly. So that's why most people generally regard the Dunedon to be as not good of a choice anyway. Uh, interestingly, I've only played with it once, and he actually saved me from getting hit twice, and I won the game. But uh, that, that was quite lucky. Um, in general, just most people regard the original Strider to, to be better. So that's why, that's at the bottom of my list anyway. That's number nine. Uh, number eight is original Gandalf, the Grey Wanderer. Like, he's he's good. Uh, the ability to, you know, play a Palantir, play a card, get to draw a new card. But, like, I did the math. Narya is better just five out of six times. Like, any of the other results that Narya gives you is is better than the probably getting to draw a card. Because, on average, you will maybe... It's, it's slightly over 50% odds that you get one Palantir in your turn. But then it's also, what are the odds that you have a card that you want to play? Uh, that doesn't always happen, you know. So there's decent odds that Gandalf Grey Wanderer will be useless to you in the first turn, possibly useless again in the second turn. Whereas Keeper, the Narya Keeper, you know, gives you five out of six odds of something useful. To be fair, if you're really scared of that eye, of uh, the Narya die rolling an eye, then maybe Grey Wanderer is for you. But, um, so anyway, uh, Grey Wanderer is number eight. Uh, number seven, I, I put Legolas as the next worst one because the elves are usually brought to war fairly quickly anyway, either by an attack or by the Balrog and you just need a couple monster dice. And the thing about bringing a nation to war early 
is that you want to muster somewhere ahead of time, right? And the elves are the last people you want to muster somewhere ahead of time because, you know, say you do bring the elves to war early and you muster an extra two elites in Woodland Realm. Great. I'm just going to go blow up these other strongholds because now there's nothing left. You know, if you also play Cured in ships, then you're, you're just clean out. Like that's now you're out of elves and now Galadriel is very weak. So uh, just mustering the elves early is, is usually not fantastic anyway. So, um, okay. Next up, I would say separating just one Hobbit as the next, uh, as my next least favorite anyway. So, if you're separating a hobbit, it's because you're either, you know, hopeful that Fear Fire Foes is going to show up or you're, you know, planning on mustering the north down three times. Uh, which which can work. That can help defend the dew line for sure. And of course, you're only, you know, losing one leadership, uh, losing one corruption value from the fellowship. It's just the downside is that because there's no Balrog helping you, you need to muster them by hand three times or like maybe you put this guy in the way and he gets hit. So you need to muster them twice before you can muster in Dale. But the Shadow Player just has this army here ready to go. So they just need, well, they already have one muster guaranteed from the token if you separate this companion. So they just need three attacks turn one to get to Dale. And then your mustering of the north is not very useful anymore. Uh, granted, he can help defend the Shire, but that doesn't come up most games. So that's why I don't think separating a Hobbit is very good. Um, next up, uh, this is the only double recommendation that I would put out. If you're going to separate two companions, this is how I would, I would recommend it. Normally, I would recommend just one. But if you're going to do two, I think a Hobbit and Boromir is the way to go because literally all three of the other ones mainly help defend the Dewline. Like Legolas, Gimli, a Hobbit, they all defend the Dewline. Boromir is the only one... Hey, there's a cute little alarm for me. Um, Boromir is the only one who defends elsewhere and he defends Gondor, obviously. So he can be he can be pretty strong up there. And I might as well just pivot into my one my next higher recommendation up to number four is Boromir. So defending Gondor is is pretty cool because it's one companion and he's helping protect these five victory points. You know, um, you can activate Gondor early and get them to war uh, just with any two dice. And now you can muster into Dol Amroth and Minas Tirith. So so that is helpful. Um, I guess it's just that. I would rather defend the Dewline personally, and uh, because it's, it's more vulnerable, and and there's a chance that you know, like there's all these armies here, so that there's you know, by the time Shadow players coming to Gondor anyway, like even if these do both have two elites, they might just take them out anyway. And Minas Tirith is just such a well defended stronghold in the first place. Like there's uh, like one regular will probably get back here usually, or if not, Guards of the Citadel and Firemere's Rangers are both out there, so. Just there's a good chance that they're just going to ignore Minas Tirith, and then you don't get the combat value of that companion very much. So, anyway, like Boromir is strong. I think if I'm separating just one companion, he's my second choice. So then the next option that, so I kind of have two. It's kind of a third and second. Uh, I'll say third first. So third is no one out in my opinion, is the next best, specifically with the alternate hobbits. So the alternate hobbits have a special ability that when they're in the fellowship together, if everyone else is gone, uh, these two are the guides now. If they're both still in the fellowship and one of them is using their guide ability, you may sacrifice both of them to completely cancel one hunt tile. So if you're in Mordor and you just drew an eye that was going to do like five damage, you can cancel both of these hobbits together to cancel that eye. So at the same time, it makes it dangerous to take random companions at any point the whole way through the game. So that's why I rank it as number third as a little bit worse than the original. But this is also, this can work well though, if you're planning on separating Strider early on. So that's, that's why I specifically recommend alternate hobbits with not separating anyone else. Is because this way, um, after you separate Strider, you can just kill through the companions entirely without risking any randoms and then use their guide ability later on. Um, and I don't recommend usually, like if you separated Boromir to start with, I wouldn't recommend also separating Strider just because the, the Fellowship is getting a little fragile at this point. Like with the, the Chief of the Ring Rays out there, if you get revealed early on, you can take a lot of damage. So... 
Uh, personally, I usually refrain from crowning Aragorn if I separate anyone at the start. But I mean, if the game gives it to you easily and you have good cards, like it might still be a good idea. Uh, that's the thing. Like this is just uh, kind of my my own opinions, really. Like there's there's so much flexibility in this game for things changing. So uh, number two, my number two recommendation would be No One Out, where it's literally all original companions except Gandalf Narya as guide. And number three, uh, sorry, number one, the last one that uh, is obviously the only one left is Gimli. So I think Gimli is the strongest one because not only is he, he's helping defend the dew line, right? Because you could get the dwarves to war and you're not really worried about over mustering here because how often do you want to muster an Arid Lewin? Uh, you, you know, like a, with a couple spare musters, you can muster the bejesus out of Erebor and I, suddenly it becomes very, very un pleasant like that's that's just not fun to take at all and you for the rest of the game you're threatening to try to retake dale if they did take woodland realm and dale then you're threatening to retake dale and the other reason that i like the dwarves well the other reason there's a couple other ones after the balrog comes in he helps muster the dwarves round down right so you're taking utilization of that early muster so now it only takes two random dice and uh by the way a keeper die you know like it comes with random Die results like an army or uh, what am I looking for? The card draw one. There's a card draw one on all of these. Come on. Where are you? There it is. A card draw one, which is kind of useless, but you can use that, you know, either with Strider to hide the fellowship or with a companion to muster down a nation. So personally, I really like separating at least one companion. Uh, there's an argument to be made for each companion, but just personally, I think Gimli is the best anyway. Right, because not only he takes advantage of that free muster, you want to muster up Erebor as much as you can ahead of time. You're threatening to retake Dale. But also Erebor is fairly out of the way. It gives you that couple turns where like if turn one, you really don't want to spend any of your dice mustering down the dwarves, that's okay. They're probably not going to put Erebor under siege. And if they did, you know, they probably blew a hole through Dale and now you have time to muster up the elves and muster up in Woodland Realm. Um... Yeah, it's just that you have time to to use the inefficient dice to muster them down to war so that like, they're probably going to take Woodland Realm first and then you have time to make Erebor strong. And I don't threaten retaking Dale, but maybe retaking Woodland Realm. And also, he's the only companion out of the ones to defend the Dew Line that is actually here to fight, right? Because the Shire, uh, the Hobbits are all the way over here in the Shire. So they're not going to actually help you fight here in the Dewline. And Legolas does show up in the Woodland Realm, but there's still decent odds that he gets put under siege and this army is still just a 1-1-1, right? Because they'd have to muster the elves all the way down to three times and then have a muster die. And there's a decent chance that this Dol Guldur army is going to come and just play a deadly strife and blow them up anyway. So anyway, that's why I think Gimli is your best value for defending the Dewline in general. Now, a lot of the time people will just ignore the Dewline altogether after you've separated Gimli um, at which point I would say, good job, Gimli. You have successfully, um, you know, made the do line so unappetizing that they ignored five points off the map entirely. And I can focus my defensive resources elsewhere. So anyway, um, that is my opinion. Uh, feel free to let me know why I'm an idiot in the comments. Thanks. Bye.